Hi everyone, this is Abel. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today we have a lot of really interesting books to talk about, but this is also a special episode because for the first time I have a guest. In this video where I have an interview with author Richard Swan. You may know it because he's the author of The Justice of King, the first book in the Empire of the Wolf trilogy that I reviewed um, a couple of videos ago, I think. It's a very good book and this is an experiment, you'll see why when we get to the point in the second part of the video, but of course we are talking about new books, books that I don't know, books that I have been directly added to my TBR, this is going to be fun, let's get ready. But before we start, remember that if you enjoy science fiction and fantasy books, this is the perfect place for you. So if you want to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing, leave a like, share this video. Thank you. The first book I'll mention today is Black Mark by Jean Law Carlson. This is the first book in a high fantasy trilogy, which is completed. And as far as I can tell, there's also another trilogy and that it's a prequel to this one. But Black Mark is about a group of elite warriors called Kingsmen that suddenly vanished a decade ago. And the protagonist of this book was part of this elite and he's, he's been called back to the capital city of, the, of that kingdom because he is connected to that disappearance. He has this long history with the royal family it looks like there's been some kind of plot to um, uh, so so this disappearance is still a, is still a mystery and he has to decide if he wants to be involved in the search for uh, for for those kingsmen because uh, there's some kind of uh, new elements and new proofs surfacing again uh, to try and understand what actually happened and he has to work with uh, with his sister which is still working in the capital in, in contact with the government and with the royal family. And they have to struggle together to understand how much, in, if and how much they want to be involved. And of course, when they finally get involved to try and understand what really happens. It's really interesting because this is marketed as an epic fantasy. It's like something, something that will be interesting for people in love with Game of Thrones and all the modern epic fantasy that we love so much. But this central mystery that drives at least the beginning of the story is really, really enticing for me. So I want to know what, what's going on, especially because of this long baggage that the protagonist has uh, with, the, with the government, with the royal family, uh, with the whole situation, with the whole political situation and his internal struggle. So I want to know what happened <laughs> and I will let you know what I think about the book as soon as possible. Then we have a space opera by author Stephen Gaskell. Gaskill? Don't know how to pronounce it. Of course, because this is one of my videos and I don't know how to pronounce names and surnames, okay? So this space opera is about a young pilgrim. It's called in the description uh, Siwa. Siwa is easy. And he is a pilgrim, I guess, because he's part of a population uh, that travels through the star and they're star ferrying they say in the description so this is a space opera in the most classic way possible uh, in this aspect of the story because they travel and maybe they they're, they're finding they're tra trying to find new places where to live new planet new inhabitable uh, inhabitable planet but of course they're been hunted by an implacable enemy and something is happening when he, he, he uncovers a secret. There's a traitor in his culture and in, the, in this group of people traveling through the stars that it is connected to this enemy that is hunting these people. So he has to embark on a journey to discover the truth about this traitor and maybe save his people from uh, this powerful enemy. So I love the idea of an entire culture, civilization, that it is, um, has dedicated the, their existence to traveling and trying to find, to explore the universe and new, and new places to live. 
And I also know the classic cat and, max, uh, and cat and mouse dynamic when there is this powerful enemy trying to catch our heroes. So let's see how the story goes. This is really, really, really interesting for me. Then an epic fantasy book written by a duo, Ryan Kirk and Taylor Crook, which are both completely new authors for me, even if they have um, independent series aside of this one. So I'm probably going to check out the other series too. But Path of the Eternal Sun, this one has, a, has multiple POVs and it is about uh, a general, Sato. Uh, which is an, a man of duty that faces a new threat to his homeland. This homeland is called Samus or Samas. It has some kind of um, deep Eastern aesthetic or may maybe even ancient Japan. I don't know exactly. We'll discover when I read the book. <laughs> and then there is another POV, which is the point of view of a giant called the Beast that has a new enemy and then we have young Shin who must find courage to um, decide if to keep trusting the um, uh, the culture when she leaves him because it looks like the system is turning against her and all of this all of these characters are going to converge in a bigger struggle in a big conflict i liked when the book have this kind of larger scope when different characters from from extremely different background and different places and different way of lives finally converge in a unique and cohesive storyline uh, i think that's one of the beauties of epic fantasy and high fantasy when you have this large cast and um, especially when they um when they are united in a way with a through line on a thematic level so i'm really curious about this it looks like the book are pretty short too so even if it has this large scope this should be really easily digestible and i think that the trilogy is completed so if i enjoyed the first one i'll absolutely plunge and go away and read the rest of the books really fast hopefully because i'm getting i'm getting better you know <laughs> one of the few things that I uh, wish that will, uh, I was able to do, one of my um, wish wishes for the for this year was to finish and complete a trilogy within one year, and I'm almost there. I'm getting there. I'm getting better. So hopefully this will be one of the uh, of the many series that I start and that I finished in a reasonable amount of time. Let's see how it goes. Ruins of Ivy by Aaron Ransby. Fun fact, the author of this first book in a trilogy wrote a comment in my last video mentioning the fact that the covers of this series have been designed by Jeff Brown because there was a specific section of that video when I was saying I was talking about another book and I said I like this cover and by now I'm able to tell when a book cover has been designed by Jeff Brown because he is so good but he also has this distinctive style that you can recognize if you have seen a reasonable amount of book covers designed by him and he said uh, yes he is amazing he's a, he's a great designer and three books from my series have been already uh, blessed with the covers by him so being a curious one <laughs> i went and stalked the author i found the covers and i found this series which looks really interesting and it gives me uh, guardians of, of the galaxy vibes because it's about flint that is he's a survivor to a brutal attack and he has to make an important choice because he has lost all of his friends which should have been have been kidnapped and he has to go and try to save them and find them and i like that it has a really easy concept and this really peculiar aesthetic that it's both post-apocalyptics and a kind of um, hard sci-fi too but it also have people that don't look completely human <laughs> they have animal traits on their face so and they're on their body too so yeah i'm really curious hopefully i'm going to read it really soon and let you know then we have the aspect of essence by samantha get ready for the next butchering 
Amsatz. Um, toots, <laughs> please, Samantha, if you, if you ever see this video, don't be mad. They know, all the other followers and subscribers, they know how bad I am. So, because I didn't even bother to ask Google Translator to pronounce <laughs> uh, this surname. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm bad at this. But the look is extremely interesting. And yeah, look at the cover and, re and read the name and surname of this uh, of this, this author because I will never be able to pronounce it. And it's about elves that are in dire straits. They're in, they're in a really bad situation culture-wise because they look like they, they are not able to have twin children anymore. So they try to have half-breeds with other, other, uh, other species and, and humans, of course. So the story is around this um, because there's a, a researcher which is an elf and a girl which is a half-breed of uh, half human and half elf that have to work together and at the same time uncovering secrets about their cultures this is really interesting as uh, as an in, in as the beginning as a uh, as the spark that um, that becomes the fire <laughs> of this story because we have different kind of elves in different kind of stories and sometimes they're exactly how you expect them to be those ethereal almost angel-like creatures from the original um, original which is not completely original but the interpretation that tolkien gave us of that which, is, which are extremely popular as, as, especially in the all of the media that tries to say really close to his vision of elven people because they can be um, it is really easy to uh, to deviate from that giving compelling interpretation like the one you had in um, dragon age for example or in other video games or epic fantasy stories like for example and uh, books from philip quentrell well, uh, where elven, elven elves and elven people are basically uh, epic predator. So you see, there, there's, a, there's, a lo there's a large uh, amount of interpretations, and I like this one. Obviously, society is struggling because of a huge problem like this. So let's see how it goes. Um, I want to read this one. It looks like the book is marketed also as a romanticy. So it is really interesting on a world buildings and the socio-politic side, and I hope it is compelling too, as a as a romance story, which I'm not an expert by any means, but I know what I like, and I hope that I can connect with the characters. And absolutely, I will let you know. Space Opera, of course, by Jay Allen. This is the first on a long-running series. I think we have more than a dozen of those books set in the in in this storyline and spin-offs uh, so he's extremely successful he's supposed to be really good the title is duel in the dark and it is about a captain of a spaceship an aging spaceship uh, called dauntless and the captain is called baron and he is sent to a quieter sector of the ga uh, quiet sector in the in the galaxy so it's supposed to be near to the uh, to retirement probably or he's been punished for something that he did so they're trying to sideline him and, and i like characters in that when they are cor cornered in a situation in a position like that when they're supposed to uh, they're forced and they're supposed to enjoy the quiet or they're forced to stay quiet but of course being a space opera it ends up not being that quiet of a place uh, quiet of a place so he has to to face a new enemy and decide if he wants to battle that enemy and his decision will will shape the fate of the entire galaxy and humanity probably so i'm really curious because because when a series is so long running and has this kind of a uh, really loyal fan base there must be something amazing uh, about it because if you look at the the reviews this is not only really long running but it has thousands and thousands and thousands of people raving about it 
So I want to know what's the deal <laughs> with this series and I'll let you know as soon as I read it. An epic fantasy novel, a debut novel by uh, Noah Isaac. It's called, it's, it's titled Memories of Tomorrow, which is about a guy that has this um, nightmarish visions about the future, uh, about a catastrophe uh, that and this impending tomb. Uh, it looks like everything that he uh, his dreams, all of those nightmares, they eventually become true. So he's pretty sure that if he doesn't do something or anything, uh, all of his people, his beloved one, will uh, will will die because of that catastrophe that he's dreaming about. So uh, with his best friend, they decided to travel south to acquire power and abilities to fight against that impending doom. Impending doom. The concept is really easy, and. And of course, the story will be not will not be easy <laughs> because epic fantasy story they start this way, pretty contained, contained with a um, with a small amount of characters, and pretty focused on that initial plot, and then they explode <laughs> and they become huge, and that's the beauty of this kind of stories. So I'm really curious to see where the story goes, and where the and how the characters will develop. The cover is really pretty. And I like when we have characters gazing to the uh, to the land um, and in in a way asking for us to follow them in this trip. So let's see how it goes. I'm really really curious about this. And lastly, we have Renegade by Joel Shepard. This is a space opera about a lieutenant that has been accused of killing. Uh, the captain of the ship so he with another marine they uh, they run of course because uh, he wants to prove he is innocent and at the same time he is at, at the center of a huge conspiracy uh, conspiracy that it's about humanity but at the same time it's about an, an ancient um, alien species that one that once was um, had this alliance with humanity and something happened and they completely vanished and they could be resurfacing so I'm really really curious about this because I like people on the run <laughs> too bad for them but it, but it makes for really uh, engaging story structures when the pacing is usually really high and tension and the momentum keeps going it makes for really engaging stories and and also, I like to discover what actually happened. I don't know if the actual setup, uh, if he's been wrongly accused, will be shown at the beginning of the story or if it will be slowly uncovered. Let's see how, how much of a mystery we have here um, structure-wise for the story. And of course, if you match this if you pair it with ancient mysteries <laughs> and ancient uh, species and uh, ancient aliens, it's chef kiss. It's everything I can ask about from a space opera. So let's see how it goes. This is to the beginning of a, um, of a long series. I think we have at least four books. And it's a really well-regarded series because it won, um, it won a bunch of awards too. So let's see how it goes. I'll let you know as soon as possible. So now let's talk about the interview. Let's introduce the interview that I already filmed uh, last week. I decided to start having guests in my channel because I like to stay in contact with authors and to pick their minds and to try and understand their thought, their thought process, where they come from, what they want and their experience in the publishing industry. And there is a special uh, occasion for this one that makes the interview a little bit weird. <laughs> You'll see why. Because The Justice of King has been released in Italy, uh, titled La Giustizia dei Re. And I decided to help Richard's one to shine a light on this Italian edition. So the interview will actually be bilingual. So I'll ask a question in English, then I'll repeat the question in Italian. Then Richard will answer in English, of course, and I will translate that reply in Italian for my Italian followers. So 
this could be interesting if you are interested in Italian language, <laughs> if you want to li listen to uh, my, tr my translation of his answers. But if you're curious, just curious about the story, and if you want to know more about the Justice of King, if you have read the book, and if you haven't read it, and if you want to know more about the book before uh, deciding to buy it, you can skip my translation and, and just listen to his answers. I will also put the um, answer in Italian and in English uh, on the screen. Let's see how much space does it take. It will be a little trickier, it will be an experiment. But bear with me, this is the first time I, I'm interviewing someone and at the same time, the first time I'm doing this kind of live translation. So. Be kind <laughs> and let me know what you think about it, okay? Now I'll have to introduce it to introduce it to my Italian followers. Per i miei subscribers italiani c'è adesso l'intervista a Richard Swan um, per la, il rilascio di La Giustizia dei Re, um, edito in Italia da Fanucci. Quindi l'intervista è in inglese, le domande sono in inglese e in italiano, le risposte sono in inglese e italiano perché io le tradurrò contemporaneamente. L'intervista sta arrivando, tenetevi pronti. Welcome Richard and thank you for being here. This is such an honor. Thank you for being thank you for here. Me. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Benvenuto Richard. Come vi ho spiegato prima, stiamo facendo una breve traduzione, cercherò di essere il più fedele possibile a quello che Richard ci dice ed è molto felice di essere con noi. Okay, I'm going to ask you a, a couple of questions and um, thank you again for being so so keen to Ask some, uh, a few, maybe a little bit difficult questions, but, <laughs> but I hope it will be enjoyable, okay? Yeah, of course. I'm a lawyer, yeah. let's have it. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Richard <laughs> ci dice che lui è un avvocato, quindi è pronto a rispondere a qualsiasi tipo di domanda. Adesso gli faremo alcune domande in occasione del lancio del suo romanzo in italiano, che è stato pubblicato da Fanucci ed è intitolato La giustizia dei re. So, first question. Mm. Um, the Justice of King has an incredibly vivid, detailed world with so many layers of politics, morality, and power dynamics. I am curious, absolutely, what sparked the idea for this world? Uh, was there a specific historical period or personal experience that nudged you in that direction? In Italiano, la domanda è, visto che la giustizia dei re ha tanti livelli di politica, di moralità e di ehm, dinamiche di potere. Da dove viene l'idea? Come è partita l'idea? E qual è stato il periodo storico, se c'è stato un periodo storico specifico che eh, ti ha spinto eh, verso questa direzione? Please go on. <laughs> <laughs> I think initially um, the, the sort of the initial idea was because of my day job i'm you know i was a lawyer i was a disputes lawyer so i did litigation um mm -hmm. was kind of like what could you have some kind of fantastical you know fantasy lawyer you know that was the initial idea um and i sort of sat on that idea for a while and then i um it was i went to for a long weekend away in um bruges um in, mm -hmm. in belgium uh, with my wife and um there was just all this kind of like imperial flanders and you know medieval history and um you know i read a lot of history anyway in my spare yeah. time so it was kind of that and then i read imperium um by robert harris which is about the life of cicero um and i just went down like a research you know rabbit mm -hmm. hole um is this answer too long by the way <laughs> <laughs> well try to summarize it <laughs> yeah sure yeah, yeah. okay let's tra let's trans translate this a little bit Sure. Yeah, okay. so Richard ci dice che è un avvocato, quindi è esperto nella materia che poi è stata inserita nel, nel romanzo, perché Bombald è una figura che è collegata a, alla legge, se non avete ancora letto il romanzo, quindi è qualcosa che lui conosce benissimo ed è anche, eh, ha sempre avuto questa idea di inserire la parte fantastica insieme alla parte della legge. E poi, mentre era in vacanza insieme a sua moglie, a Bruges, eh, si è ritrovato ad avere un'estetica forse un po' più, eh, più fantasy, a vedere un contesto che poteva essere la base di questo world building, eh, ed essendo un appassionato lettore di storia, di libri di Robert Harris, eh, si è fatto ispirare anche alla storia di, di Cicerone e alle dinamiche che poi vedrete nel racconto, perché c'è una, 
una dinamica di voce narrante diversa dalla, dalla solita e voi vedrete e, e speriamo che questo tipo di traduzione funzioni anche per voi so, do you want to add more to that uh, answer or do you want me to, to go on with the next, uh, next question you decide uh, do I want to add more to that There'll be there's, there'll be a hundred things I could talk about. That's and I could talk about that question for an hour. So let, let's go on to the next one, and I'll keep the next answer a bit shorter. Ok, quindi andiamo con la prossima domanda perché essendo uno scrittore appassionato, giustamente lui potrebbe andare avanti per centinaia di ore. So let's talk about morality. And mm. one thing that I love is how your character exists in a um, grey area. And how do you handle writing characters like that? Is it, every, uh, is it tricky to get readers to empathize with someone who doesn't always do the right thing? Mm. So, quindi la domanda è riguardo ai personaggi grigi. Eh, perché molti dei personaggi che sono raccontati in questa storia vivono in una zona grigia. E come gestisci questo tipo di caratteri, eh, questo tipo di personaggi? Ed è difficile, è, è una sfida, aiutare i lettori ad empatizzare con questi caratteri che non, non fanno sempre la cosa giusta. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I think, you know, it's difficult to toe the line because you want a character who's at least it doesn't have to necessarily be sympathetic but they have to be compelling mm -hmm. to read about and so you don't want someone necessarily who is just doing evil things um but i think it's always interesting to watch a character compromise um mm -hmm. on their their morals and their ethical code um provided i think that they're doing it in a way that um the read that that makes sense within the context of the novel Um, okay. So they're not just kind of going from white to black, you know, mm -hmm. overnight. It's it's uh, it's it's getting that um, it's it's making it feel like a natural um, mm -hmm. shift. Um, and I suppose it's making sure that they are um, doing th sometimes bad things, but perhaps for a good reason or for the sort of the greater good. Okay. Do you know what I mean? So, okay. Okay. Let um, me let me try to to translate yeah. that. Yeah, <ride> Richard ci dice che trova interessanti personaggi che ehm, sono grigi ma hanno una ragione per cui eh, sono in questa via di mezzo non, non, per lui non sono interessanti personaggi che sono troppo buoni o troppo cattivi e cerca di inserire questo tipo di personaggio di, bel, di bilanciare gli effetti, i lati positivi e i lati negativi di ogni personaggio all'interno del contesto di farli funzionare all'interno del contesto della storia e cerca anche di dargli un arco per cui possono passare dall'essere personaggi positivi a negativi o da negativi a positivi a stare in questa linea di mezzo eh, cercando di farli sembrare ragionevoli senza dargli degli archi che passino in maniera troppo brusca dalla positività alla negatività perché non funzionerebbero e non sarebbero credibili e fondamentalmente questo li rende anche più interessanti per i lettori eh, ed è uno dei motivi per cui secondo me il romanzo ha avuto così tanto successo so this dynamic is one of the strength of the novel mm. I think because it makes yeah. every one of them so interesting uh, Von mm. Bolt and uh, Helena herself um, mm. do you call it Dubin or Duban <laughs> or, uh, or Duban. Bessinger? Duban yeah, no, Duban Quindi, Bessinger yeah, yeah. <laughs> io penso che siano molto interessanti proprio per questi suoi personaggi perché sono eh, tutti da Von Bolt, da Deneda, uh, a Helena a, a Duban sono eh, hanno dei lati positivi ma sono anche capaci di fare cose cattive so and how uh, how did your um, reader react to that kind of grayness did they expect um protagonists of your uh, novels to be like that or did they expect something else what kind of feedback did you have i tuoi lettori come hanno reagito a questo essere grigi come hanno um, come si relazionano ai tuoi personaggi i think um i think people the the fact that von volt character changed over the course of the trilogy was kind of signposted quite early on because it's sort of Helena mm -hmm. reflecting back on her life with him when she was mm -hmm. in her like early 20s so um you know she so okay I, I love using kind of dramatic irony and and sort of foreshadowing <laughs> uh, in my mm -hmm. um in my books sort of mm -hmm. my favorite literary techniques and so I think a few times she says you know oh von Volt become you know 
Von Vol yeah. used to be such a great guy, and you know, it's a, it's a real <laughs> shame what happened to him. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, so it's sort of, it's quite te it's telegraphed um, throughout the book. Mm -hmm. So I think people were expecting it, but I sus I suspect some people probably thought he was going to go completely mm -hmm. off the rails, you know, full evil mm -hmm. kind of. And so I think some people maybe were expecting it to be more extreme than it, mm -hmm. you know, than it turned out to be in the end. Um, you know, so but I but I think it was, you know, as I say, sort of telegraphed quite early in the in the book, so mm -hmm. people knew it was coming. And I, and I think the inter, the relationship between Helena and Von Bolt is is so core to the to the the series. Exactly, um, exactly. So I think. People Quindi il pubblico it. in generale ha reagito bene a questo tipo di dinamica. Forse alcuni di loro si aspettavano che soprattutto Von Bolt, il protagonista, facesse una un arco negativo più ripido e che diventasse subito un, un personaggio estremamente pericoloso e violento. E invece no. Eh, voi leggerete il romanzo, non vi vogliamo spoilerare niente, però vi renderete conto che alla fine del, del suo arco, in questo romanzo, lui ha una, un arco negativo fondamentalmente eh, cambia ma non cambia in una maniera che, che non funziona nel contesto della storia let's go with the third question ok? facciamo la terza okay. domanda riguardo mm -hmm. proprio la traduzione about the translation uh, with the book coming, uh, coming out in Italy how do you mm -hmm. feel about reaching a whole new audience and do you think certain themes or part of the story might hit differently with Italian readers compared to your English speaking audience quindi la domanda eh, riguarda proprio il romanzo in italiano <ride> e al fatto che eh, se ci sono dei dubbi sul fatto che il pubblico italiano possa interagire in maniera diversa con questa storia, proprio perché è un pubblico così diverso da quello originale, americano e inglese, e il fatto che alcuni temi potrebbero eh, risuonare in maniera diversa rispetto a come l'hanno recepito il, il resto del pubblico. So what do you think about this? I think especially, I mean, especially it Italians would would kind of vibe with it quite well because obviously Sova is so heavily inspired by Rome, um, mm -hmm. Imperial Rome. And um, I sort of imagine if Imperial Rome never declined, if it just kind of transitioned from the late, late antiquity to a sort of 15th century, more or less <laughs> intact. So that's kind of like what Sova is. And they even have glad Gladii, you know, that's the, the, sh the yeah. Sovan short word is a Gladii. Yeah. So, um, you know, and there's just little, um, you know, the, t the, the, the two-headed wolf, you know, this kind of the Romulus and Remus um, style, uh, you know, references and things like that. So um, I would, I would, I hope that, uh, you know, Italian readers especially would probably quite enjoy that side of things. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, maybe they won't. <laughs> but, uh, Let's hope uh, they will. <laughs> yeah, quite. <cool. laughs> Allora, credo che Richard ci dice che il romanzo ha un'estetica che noi possiamo ri riconoscere facilmente, che teoricamente dovrebbe piacerci, perché molto dell'impero, il Sovian Empire, l'impero di Sova, che, viene, che fa da world building, da contesto uh, a questo mondo, è, è molto simile alla Roma imperiale. Quindi il fatto che esteticamente sia così simile a qualcosa che noi conosciamo bene dovrebbe semplificarci la vita. E poi il fatto che spesso questo impero viene definito come un, un, un lupo a due teste o, o, o due lupi ricorda la mitologia della, dei popoli preromani e, del, e di quello che poi ha costruito l'epoca romana. Quindi probabilmente eh, l'impatto estetico dovrebbe essere semplice da, da recepire, le tematiche anche, e lui ci spera proprio. So we'll, we'll see pretty soon. Many readers will, uh, have, will, will approach this book in Italian for the first time, of course. Mm. But most of the core audience will be familiar with it <laughs> because it's been a couple of years ago. So, so, so right. the book is not exactly new, but we are happy mm. to see it in Italy and to, you know, so. we somehow we try to cheer up authors and kind of influence the taste and the direction mm. of publishing houses so nice. they get there because it had some kind of a good reception uh, outside in us and uk right. but we were clamoring for the book to come in italy <laughs> so, mm. no, no. so we well, probably had a good reception quindi it, probabilmente yeah, è arrivato in italia proprio anche perché noi abbiamo fatto un po da fan e aspettavamo che arrivasse e molte persone aspettavano che fosse tra tradotto e quindi ci sono delle buone probabilità che andrà che andrà bene and i was speaking to Ryan Cahill a few days ago 
about okay. um, the translation of Blood and Fire with the same mm. publishing house that translated your book. And, mm. um, and I was warning him to do not expect a lot of reviews <laughs> because Italian people <laughs> really don't like writing reviews right. on Amazon. I don't know why it's a cultural <laughs> thing. It will have yeah. a huge word of mouth, a good reception sure. on uh, social media, but on right. Amazon, hmm, maybe not. <laughs> no, sure. I don't know I, why. I saw on Goodreads, I think it was like two reviews, and I was like, blimey, yeah. it's and, and, no, no, Don't sleep on it. <laughs> because it will probably <laughs> sell absolutely well, but sure. reviews, the, they're a tricky thing here in Italy. Mm. E gli ho detto che in Italia, purtroppo, noi con le recensioni siamo lasciamo un po' a desiderare. Quindi probabilmente non ce ne saranno tante, perché culturalmente noi lasciamo poche recensioni in italiano. E sarà così. Eh, lasciamo perdere, speriamo bene. About the voice. Mm. Crafting Von Volt as, as a character. Mm. He is a really fascinating character. He's torn between his duty and his own internal conflict. How do you uh, approach creating his voice? Was it thought balancing uh, his role uh, and his authority figure while showing his moment of vulnerability? Quindi parliamo di Von Walt come personaggio e il fatto che è diviso fra il dovere e i suoi conflitti interni e in che modo l'autore è riuscito a bilanciare questi due ruoli, la sua vulnerabilità con il suo senso del dovere. That's a tricky question. <laughs> mm. I, I, it's a good question though, and I think the, um, the, the answer to that question, when you read, and it's quite, it's quite a small part of the Justice of Kings, but if you read it, there's a bit, and it, and it will tell you everything you need to know about Mon Bol. And mm -hmm. that's that he isn't a native Sovan, so his father mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um did what's called taking the high mark which is when you 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 essentially accept a bribe yeah. um and then your position in whatever civilization that you previously existed in is just transposed into the the new servant empire so if you were like a count in you know yagerland mm -hmm. now you're a count in the servant empire yeah. and um and so von volt's father did that and so von volt is a non-native servant and so he um he accepts his role and he fought in the Reichskrieg. Um, so he mm -hmm. has a kind of a, a zeal, a zealousness um, mm -hmm. in his belief that the Soviet legal system um, is this great leveler because it's the thing that justifies the bloody conquest um, mm -hmm. and, and, and Soviet's sort of expansion and vassalization of all those countries um, was, hor was a horror. Um, but the legal system that it imposes, this system of common law, is a very good thing to have come out of it. And so that's why he believes in it so strongly. Um, and I mm -hmm. think it's, and Helena says at, at one point, I think she says, um, it might be in Tyranny of Faith, sec the second book. Um, mm -hmm. She said, you know, the, the core of von Volt's worldview was actually quite, this, they had this vulnerability to it because if um, this the system of justices and the magistratum fails then it was all for nothing you know the the, okay. the conquest and the mm -hmm. it was and so he's got this kind of vulnerability which is why he believes in it so strongly and so vehemently mm -hmm. and why it's mm -hmm. so hard for him and we see a little bit of it at the end of the book too the first mm -hmm. one yeah that's right yeah yeah, yeah. changing his disposition mm -hmm. about the, the the loyal organization that's so, right uh, richard ci dice che um, il core di, del personaggio di Bombalt è il fatto che lui viene da una popolazione che è stata assimilata dall'impero quindi le sue origini non sono dell'impero lui è diventato parte di quella, di quella nazione quando i suoi genitori hanno giurato e si sono sottomessi quindi la popolazione di quelle zone che sono state ammesse sono diventate parte dell'impero e lui ha interiorizzato una venerazione e un rispetto verso l'impero che viene proprio dal rispetto che lui ha per il sistema eh, delle leggi dell'impero e li ha interiorizzate talmente tanto che sono la base della sua personalità fondamentalmente e quindi eh, ci dice Richard nel secondo romanzo c'è una discussione tra Elena e Von Walt in cui le, lei dice che se lui perdesse questo attaccamento al sistema giuridico dell'impero eh, andrebbe a crollare proprio come persona quindi il conflitto eh, di lui come persona e come personaggio viene da questo suo provenire da una popolazione che è stata assimilata e dall'essere eh, una persona che poi si è, eh, de um, è diventata devota al 100% all'impero and I think that's one of the, um, the strength of, of the book mm. because he, he is so peculiar 
Uh, mm. I have read a lot, a ton of fantasy books, a lot okay. of fantasy series. Yeah. But I don't think I have ever seen anything like this, like Von Volk. Oh, well. mm. Something oh, like Hena- Helena, yes. Brand- Bressinger mm. too, yes, of course. Sure. But Von Volk, mm, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> è un personaggio veramente, veramente originale, Von Volk. Non credo di aver mai visto niente del genere, soprattutto in un romanzo fantasy. About the legal system and the mm. justice. Justice plays such a huge role in the story, especially with Von Volk's character. And in, in, in a way, you, you already answered a little bit for, of, the, of, this, of this question. Did you pull mm. from any real world loyal, uh, loyal legal system or historical event when crafting his profession or philosophy? Um, and what did you really want to explore about justice through him? La domanda ci dice parla proprio del sistema giuridico e chiediamo a Richard se lui si è ispirato a qualcosa di realmente accaduto, storico, a filosofie che sono reali e che cosa cercava di esplorare con questa storia eh, dal punto di vista della giustizia. That's an even cheaper um, one, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I've got, I've got an answer for it. I think... Um... You know, well, obviously, it's English law, um, and uh-huh. it's 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 an it's an anachronistic, um, very modern version of English common law uh, mm-hmm. that I've kind of transposed into a sort of very early 16th century, yeah. 15th century world. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, um, and so that is that is it at its core, and I, and I think the, the sort of the case in um, the Justice of Kings, which is which I love reminding people is marine insurance fraud um, because people <laughs> people think it's a murder mystery but actually <laughs> yeah 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 it is it's that um you know was based on some of the work i was doing at the time mm-hmm. uh, without the murder aspect i, I didn't do that. <laughs> uh, hopefully <laughs> um But I think when I was, you know, when I was training to be a lawyer uh, in my academic training and we did something called jurisprudence, which is the, the philosophy of law. Yeah. Um, and there are and there are two competing theories about, you know, justice. And um, the first is what we call deontologism, um, which is that the, the most important thing is the rules themselves. So as long as you have a, yeah. a, a set of rules, which is you know, validly imposed, okay. As, yeah. cleaving to the rules is the important thing. And on the other hand, you have consequentialism, which mm. is that um, the result is what is important, irrespective of the rules yeah. and the consequence. And so what we see in the over the trilogy is basically, and I wanted to explore these things. Um, and so um, it's, 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 the, it's sort, of the, sort of the question, I always put it like this, um, you know, should Captain America have just got a sniper rifle and shot Thanos in the head from a kilometer away and and end you know and the and the and the deontologist would say no that's murder um and the consequentialist would say yeah it's fine because the outcome is so much better than mm-hmm. you know what might come to pass if he was allowed to succeed um and it's the tension between those and neither one is correct um mm-hmm. it's just It's where it's wherever you or a given society falls on that scale, um, mm-hmm. and, I, and and it was me examining that legal philosophy um, okay. and, and how von Volk goes from one to another over the course of the trilogy. And, and you did it amazingly, I would say. Well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let, let let me flex my muscle as a translator. Yeah, for good this luck one. with that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a couple Indeed. of minutes. <laughs> Richard, she dice che. Essendo lui ovviamente un professionista, è stato un professionista, ha studiato eh, giurisprudenza. Yeah, in Italy we say only uh, uh, jurisprudence. There's no other, other definition for what you study uh, to become a lawyer. <laughs> Quindi lui ci dice che ad esempio c'è una parte importante del romanzo che riguarda le assicurazioni navali. Il modo in cui nel commercio eh, funziona, il meccanismo delle assicurazioni che sembra in effetti un po' a volte dello strozzinaggio perché tu vai ad assicurare delle, a, a cercare di ripararti da degli eventi che non sai se accadranno e quindi c'è una grossa porzione della storia che riguarda proprio questo come un nobile si inserisce nel meccanismo crea un meccanismo di assicurazione all'interno della sua ehm, della città dove vive e si arricchisce perché diventa uno dei primi assicuratori ed è qualcosa che lui ha voluto inserire perché fa da tramite, eh, tramite per spiegare un conflitto 
eh, che c'è all'interno della giurisprudenza e della disciplina della legge fondamentalmente in Inghilterra, che è quello che ha poi piazzato in, in un contesto politico ed estetico diverso, perché c'è, eh, ci sono due correnti diverse, una che eh, punta a, eh, ad assegnare alla disciplina della legge soltanto il rispetto delle regole nella maniera più specifica possibile, più letterale possibile, e un'altra che si occupa di ottenere il risultato migliore. E a volte queste, per chi eh, pratica la legge, vanno in conflitto. E lui ci ha fatto un esempio breve, come esempio parlando di Capitan America, dice può prendere un fucile e sparare in faccia a, a Thanos per ottenere il risultato migliore? Eh, c'è chi direbbe sì, e qualcun altro direbbe che è un omicidio perché va ad infrangere alcune libertà personali privando qualcun altro di, di libertà specifiche. E eh, gran parte del primo romanzo, ma in generale in tutta la trilogia, serve proprio a esplorare questo tipo di domande. Se il fine giustifica i mezzi, quanto è possibile applicare regole eh, specifiche, leggi specifiche, quanto ci si deve attenere alla realtà delle leggi per come sono state scritte e quanto è possibile girarci attorno, eh, cercando di evitare qualche proiettile per ottenere il risultato migliore. E questo credo che sarà quello che i lettori apprezzeranno di più eh, all'interno della narrazione Ed è quello che sicuramente ha reso il romanzo così affascinante per me And hopefully uh, people able to uh, understand English and Italian will appreciate mm. that And will not come in the comments <laughs> saying that's not exactly what he said He said, said so good. far more <laughs> I like what I've known, I've known. <laughs> he had such a good answer you, you yeah. butchered that answer <laughs> oh, hopefully not right. quindi siate gentili nei commenti um, let's keep a, a couple of questions ok? because there, is, there, is, there are a couple of those I don't think we'll have the time to answer all the questions sure. because I yeah, sent yeah. people uh, I sent Richard 13 questions <laughs> quindi ho mandato a Richard 13 domande diverse però non credo mm. che, av che avremo tempo per rispondere a tutti Um, there is a thing about um, Elena, Elena's role. That's one of mm. the main questions that fascinated me as a, as a, as a writer myself. Uh, and it was a, um, a really interesting situation and uh, a really interesting decision. And I think uh, a little bit uh, was discussed in an interview that you did with um, the library of Alexandria. Mm. It was I think it was the first time I uh, heard about the book. Right. Yeah, I, th I think it was he, he sparked my interest, he piqued my right. interest about well, the book in that interview. Yeah, yeah. Quindi facciamo un una, una domanda che riguarda Elena. Ed è I mean, uh, Helena's role is uh, it's a cool choice giving mm. us a unique perspective on Volvald and everything going on. And what led to the decision to have her tell the story and how did you think her perspective changed the way readers see Von Vold? Per gli italiani sappiate che il protagonista del romanzo è Von Vold, ma il suo non è dal suo punto di vista, è raccontato dal punto di vista della sua assistente che si chiama Elena, una sua apprendista e quindi quello che vediamo è filtrato dal punto di vista di Elena. Perché? So why did you decide to go that way? I think um It's it's an interesting question, and in you know, I, I, some people. I think most people think it's a it's the good, the good and the right choice. You always get some people. It was a surprise, like it, absolutely. Yeah. Mm, <laughs> well, well, people. I think people certainly expected it to be from Von Bolt's perspective, and I, mm, um, yeah. and when it wasn't. But I mean, I don't think that's I don't think that's as, as interesting a story. And I think, um, you know, part of what Von Bolt makes Von Bolt an interesting and compelling character is he's an he's a he's an enigma. Um, yeah. you know, you, you, and precisely because you don't know why, what he's thinking or what's going on in his head, um, is what makes his decision this interesting. We, we go, we can only, and because we only see it through Helena's eyes, we, the mm. reader are reacting along with Helena to, um, his choices and decisions. And so we are trying to understand them at the same time Helena is. So yeah. it's kind of like, a, it's got a nice, um, in much the same way that, um, Helena has the world and the, and the magistratum and the magic system is sort of explained to her and okay. therefore the reader mm -hmm. um it's quite a nice way of putting some distance between you and the protagonist um mm -hmm. and i wanted to convey with von bolt this sense of this kind of this great man of history um there's this mm -hmm. kind of theory in history that 
discredited theory um, that, <laughs> um, <laughs> that history is is moved by these great figures, you know, like okay. know, mm-hmm. Churchill and Roosevelt or whatever. Um, <laughs> it's nonsense, but you know, but this idea that um, that's the, that's yeah. how you know Caesar, you know, these pe- these individuals yeah. move. They made the history. Wheels of history. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and. Um, the reality is, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a much more complicated than that. Um, <laughs> a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Of course. Um, <laughs> but this idea of Von Vault being this, this great man of history, and I wanted to put that barrier between him and the reader to preserve mm-hmm. some of the mystique and the aura mm-hmm. around him and so that we could never truly know his character. Um, and I think it just makes a much more compelling and interesting narrative. It was a bold move. Because mm. usually any kind of barrier, the editors mm. and uh, whoever, they tell, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> so that you don't no. uh, uh, you know, impair any kind of connection with the reader. That's right. But it worked mm. beautifully. <laughs> it was a, bo- a bold move. No, but I think it's think. one of right. the many things that makes the, mm. uh, the novel so unique mm. and so effective. Mm. Quindi Richard ci dice che lui ha deciso di far raccontare la storia dal punto di vista di Elena proprio per creare un senso di mistero, per rendere Bombald una sorta di rebus da, da scoprire e anche perché questo ha preservato intatto un'atmosfera di ehm, rende Bombald un personaggio da scoprire insieme a come lo scopre Elena. Quindi filtrato dal punto di vista... Eh, si mantiene una, un, una grandeur, una, un'immagine di, di personaggio storico molto importante che ha creato e influenzato la storia eh, della nazione che è al centro della storia. Un po' come per la storia eh, moderna, anche se sappiamo che effettivamente non è così, ma spesso si dice che la storia è fatta dai grandi personaggi, dai grandi, dai grandi condottieri, dai grandi personaggi storici. Sappiamo che non è così, ma in questo modo i personaggi restano affascinanti e sono più affascinanti da scoprire. È stata una scommessa perché spesso nella narrazione moderna non si fa, non si pongono delle barriere per schermare i, i lettori dal personaggio, ma in questo caso è stato efficace perché Von Balt resta un personaggio estremamente eh, criptico ma anche aff- a- a- affascinante. So, given the fact that you have a completed trilogy now, Mm. And that we are waiting for some kind of an announcement that you teased. You, you didn't say anything specific. We know that you basically sold something to some kind of publisher, okay? Mm. But you're now in a position to give some kind of advice, okay? To mm. new readers and especially new, new authors. So mm. for white writers who want to create deep, complex words, and characters like you've done, what advice mm. would you give, especially for those trying to go beyond the typical fantasy tropes and just magic and epic battles? Quindi la domanda è, visto che lui ha una trilogia di successo alle spalle, che probabilmente ci sarà qualche annuncio riguardo alle sue prossime pubblicazioni, che consigli si sente di dare ai nuovi autori che vogliono creare personaggi profondi e che vogliono andare oltre eh, le tipiche battaglie fantasy o i classici, i cliché della letteratura fantasy. Go on, professor. I, yeah, sure. <laughs> I, um, I just think a bit different with the Empire of the Wolf uh, trilogy, which I haven't done before, which, um, because I've usually, I usually write science fiction, um, mm-hmm. was I, um, I, cre- I, I created the Soviet Empire, the world of the Soviet Empire, and what I did was, mm-hmm. I decided I wanted to try and sort of work out what kind of people the Sovens were. Um, and so I, I found this thing, it's called a cultural iceberg. Um, and you can find a picture of it online. And it will tell mm-hmm. you the tip of the iceberg above the waterline yeah. yeah. are things like, you know, the flag, the language, the mm-hmm. national dish, you know, a song. Yeah. Um, That's fascinating. The <laughs> and then below the iceberg, you've got things like, cultural attitudes to the elderly you know work Mm -hmm. children um you know and and, and everything everything like everything that makes a cult you know a person from a specific culture like you know um Mm -hmm. and and it was really it was a couple of dozen things and i really spent time so i for example so for example i thought the sovens are quite a reserved people so the kind of anglo-saxon um They're not an effusive people. They don't like big displays of emotion. Weeping in public is very frowned. Yeah, yeah. That sort of, and so they, and 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 these things feed into a a character. So, you know, von Volt, when Helena 
is crying in the novel, Von Vogel gets very awkward about it. And he's mm-hmm. sort of like, oh, I don't really know how to deal with this. And it, and that kind of little detail um, can really round out a character. Um, mm-hmm. and Because uh, all characters are just products of their environment in the same way normal human beings are. Yeah. Um, and so that was what that was one thing I did, and I think that really helped. Um, and another thing I did was, I think, give all of your characters a flaw. Um, and so with Von, and it could be mine. So with Von Volt, I I made him a hypochondriac. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and I thought, well, you know, what is what a wonderful little quirk, yeah. personality, yeah. Quirk, especially you know, for that. such a powerful person. <clears throat> exactly. Um, mm-hmm. Or like I, you know, I made Bressinger, um doggedly loyal to, to, to a fault you know to mm-hmm. von vol and, uh, and these sorts of things again and it just gives you something so von vol every time they stop in a town he'll go to like the local doctor it's one of the first things he'll do um <laughs> yeah. and it's it's just again it just provides a nice little detail mm-hmm. and a thing that the other characters can kind of latch onto and make fun of and porn so mm-hmm. um you know those are those are two sort of tangible pieces of advice i think i could give that that might give you a okay. character a bit more depth Let's go in Italian. <ride> Quindi una, una, due consigli fondamentali. Il primo è cercare di fare in modo che il contesto in cui i personaggi si uova, muovono sia il più credibile possibile. Lui ha fatto l'esempio di un iceberg. Quindi partendo dal creare le cose più semplici e più visibili, dalla bandiera al modo in cui si muovono e in cui si vestono. Sotto la superficie c'è molto di più e riguarda il modo in cui si comportano e si approcciano anche nelle relazioni con gli altri ci ha fatto un esempio perché ovviamente i suoi personaggi sono molto ispirati alla cultura anglosassone e quindi succede che sono resti a manifestare le emozioni non mostrano le loro emozioni in pubblico, non piangono e quindi succede ad esempio che quando Vonvald vede Elena piangere lui si sente terribilmente in imbarazzo perché non riesce a processare queste emozioni e questi influenzano il comportamento in tempo reale sulla pagina dei, dei personaggi quindi eh, il primo consiglio è quello di fare in modo che il world building influisca profondamente sul comportamento e sul modo di pensare dei personaggi l'altro è di dargli delle debolezze di fare in modo che ognuno di loro abbia qualcosa di debole e che forse sia anche originale rispetto al tipo di personaggio ad esempio Vonvald è un ipocondriaco cioè una persona che ha una, un terrore profondo di ogni malattia pur essendo un uomo così potente che ha delle capacità straordinarie la prima cosa che fa quando vede un, entra in un nuovo villaggio è andare a cercare il dottore per essere sicuro di avere qualcuno che lo curerà se gli succede qualcosa di brutto e quindi eh, dare eh, un world building complesso che influenza direttamente i personaggi e dare a questi stessi personaggi delle debolezze reali e questo effettivamente rende eh, le storie migliori that was an amazing answer <laughs> I'm going to take, and take note about that <laughs> there you go <laughs> I'm let's do the last, last question and then I'll, uh, I'll let you go because you have sure. a, a ton of children <laughs> I do, <laughs> very I do. I'm looking at the monitor of the baby now just to make sure <laughs> <Yeah>. wake up <laughs> Allora, last question ultima domanda What's the hardest lesson you have learned since the first book was published and became now so beloved? Quindi, qual è stata la lezione più difficile che hai imparato da quando il primo romanzo è stato pubblicato e adesso che sia il primo libro che la trilogia sono diventati dei romanzi di successo? Please. I think it's um oh, I mean, just that never <laughs> It's a tough one, isn't it? Because I think um you know, you never write to, never write to fulfill readers expectations um okay. I, and i and i've always been quite good at that i think in in you know you must always write your own novel as you mm-hmm. you know foresee it um and never as i think david bowie once said never played never played to the gallery um mm-hmm. you know you you must always forge your own path and even and and, and never be afraid i think to um conclude a novel or a series of novels in in the most predictable way if mm-hmm. that is the logical and best ending there's there's no yeah. need for a big narrative rug pull there's no need mm-hmm. for a big twist ending you know just to get one up on the readers no you know, shamalan most... moment needed <laughs> no of course no absolutely not you know just if it is the most, that's that's fine you know but the most important thing is to write a good ending not a surprise ending Um mm. and um I ha- I certainly haven't learned that since Justice of Kings was published. I think I just I've learned that generally in writing. 
Um, I think Fonda Lee actually said that, and I think I think it was mm-hmm. a really good piece of advice. So in fact, one of my favourite pieces of writing advice I've heard recently is write write the good ending, not the twist ending. Um, <laughs> so you know, but but the, in, the, in terms of the hardest lesson, I just just how slow the publishing industry is. Um, oh, yeah. You yeah. know, I'm I'm mm-hmm. so far ahead now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I finished Trials of Empire a couple of years ago, I think. Um, you know, yeah. writing, I'm so far ahead right. mentally. You're in a different uh, time period. Absolutely, <laughs> totally different headspace now. I'm, I'm, you know, you know, with the new series, you know, that's still set in Sova, but it's 200 years in the future. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm there. I'm in the, I'm in the kind of the Georgian period <laughs> of Sova now. We're, we're in like, you know, the 18th century. So the medieval period, uh-huh. I've, I've kind of put towards. But of course, that book only came out a few months ago. Um, okay. So that was a difficult thing to grapple with, for sure. Mm-hmm. Ok, let, 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 let me translate that. Mm. E quindi le, due, grandi, due grandi lezioni imparate. La prima è che non, uh, ci incoraggia a non scrivere mai cose eh, per accontentare il pubblico o per accontentare l'industria. Scrivere davvero quello che ci appassiona. E quindi di fare, non farci trascinare dalle richieste, dalle mode, perché poi trasparirà nel prodotto finale. Quindi se siamo motivati solo e unicamente dal punto di vista personale e artistico, il risultato sarà migliore. La seconda lezione è che l'industria va lentissima. Lui ci dice che ha eh, finito da poco di scrivere la serie che segue questa trilogia ed è diversi anni avanti rispetto a quello che poi viene pubblicato. E può essere frustrante questo, eh, sotto questo punto di vista. E quindi bisogna essere pazienti se si va eh, eh, per le vie tradizionali. So, about science fiction, will, will, will we ever read something of science fiction from Richard Swan? Yes. Tell us. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, you will. Uh, not for a couple of years, sadly. Uh, mm-hmm. And I can't talk about it just yet. But uh, I've okay. got a few sci-fi... I've got a few sci-fi things coming out. Uh, and the contracts have been signed. So... Wow. It's, it's definitely happening. Um, but not for a little while yet, sadly. Okay. As, that's what I'm talking about. It's very slow. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. That's what I was just Probably saying. Probably because the industry is so debile. Richard ci dice che vedremo. Io gli ho chiesto se vedremo qualcosa... Eh, di fantascienza perché lui le sue origini d'autore vengono dalla fantascienza e lui ci ha detto che sì i contratti sono già firmati non, a, non per un paio d'anni ancora perché c'è da completare un'altra trilogia dopo, dopo questa e quindi qualcosa arriverà sicuramente qualcosa arriverà dobbiamo essere pazienti anche se l'industria è così, è così, è così debole well Richard this was lovely lovely thank you so much thank you so much no thank you so much I've really enjoyed talking and That was fascinating watching you translate in real time. Um, I don't know how you do that, but that was <laughs> Quindi ho ringraziato Richard per essere stato con noi e lui per lui è stato anche affascinante sentire la traduzione in tempo reale. Um, and maybe uh, we will have more interviews about the ending of the series, hopefully we'll have the whole series in Italian. And I would love to see try. more of those, those covers. I want to see the next two. I think he's done such a fantastic yeah. job with the first one. Absolutely. Quindi Richard spera di vedere altre copertine sue in italiano di Antonello Venditti che ha fatto mm. un, un, meraviglioso, un meraviglioso lavoro e, e forse anche qualcosa delle sue, delle sue prossime pubblicazioni. And hopefully, maybe in the future, we'll have you and Fonda Lee together or other authors yeah. together in the same Fonda. interview. And you can't. Amazing. Translate three people though. You'd, you'd, your head is going to explode. Don't try me, Richard. <laughs> yeah, sure. Don't provoke me. <laughs> Quindi, forse non, un'altra intervista con altri autori, forse anche con Fonda Lee sarebbe fantastico. Ok, I'll let you go. Thank you again for being here. And Thank I'll you, see you pleasure. in the next one. Ok? Absolutely. Bye, Take Richard. Care. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you for staying until the end of the video, which is incredibly long, of course, as usual. (laughs) And this was really interesting, a really formative experience for me. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Hopefully we'll see more during the next couple of months. I don't know if we'll have interviews in every episode. But yeah, a couple couple more, because there are a bunch of authors that I will really love to interview. And yeah, so keep your eyes peeled for that. <laughs> and of course, remember that if you enjoy science fiction and fantasy books, this is the perfect place for you. So if you want to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing, leave a like, share this video. And if you want to see more videos right here and right now, you have more videos right here, right now. Thank you again. I'll see you in the next one.
Bye.